All right, so this is going to be the second part of my Lapis Lazuli uh, mixing guide. And the reason I'm saying Lapis Lazuli, this is, I mean, mixing is one of those things that's uh, pretty variable. Um, you can do a lot of different things for depending on what you're you know, actually doing. And so I don't want to make it come off as this is the be-all, end-all of mixing necessarily, but, I mean, these are really good pointers that I've used in a lot of different recordings. And a lot of these things can just be applied. And then you can, you know, mess with it from there. Realistically, it's just a starting point. But lots of different methods. And so today, we're going to go over something that's super deep, actually. Um, and, you know, just kind of going, I guess, from bottom to top in a way. Um, but bass is, it's, it's, is so ridiculous. And I want to do bass after drums, actually. So... Um, so we'll 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 start with he this, which is the, uh, the 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 distorted guitars. Distorted rhythm guitars are interesting because a lot of people use way too much uh, gain for their, their their guitars, so it ends up, you know, it ends up sounding a little like too much, and a lot of people also end up using uh, too much too many layers or too few layers or try to use too much EQ actually to get the sound that they're looking for and what you end up doing is I mean it depends on the style once again this is big and slow so you can get away with a lot more um, but what you end up doing is you try to get too much out of one thing and it causes the mess just like the layering of last episode where we were trying to get a big sound without having to make it too uh, to you, know, you, you compromise too much of the sounds by m layering more, we're doing the same thing here. It's just with different acoustic guitars. I'm using a technique popularized by Bob Rock um, in in the 80s, early 90s, with, uh, specifically people mo most from the Black Album, although it was, I think it was used on Dr. Feelgood as well by Motley Crue and the Black Album by Metallica, respectively. And that's where you have a center rhythm channel um, he dubbed it the thickener. Uh, that's exactly what it does. So I'm not going to claim credit for it, but uh, I'll go into that in just a second. These are, uh, of course, uh, no EQ on them at all. Oop. And I'll leave that just so the drums aren't in the background there. Yeah, that doesn't sound bad. I mean, that's just the raw recording uh, with the panning and the volume. So, you know, so the volume, the levels are right, um, and so is the panning. So what you would do for this normally is have... Is one on the left, one on the right. These are the same sound, but that's already nice and big. And it's just... That's a popular technique because it allows the rhythm guitars to stick out a lot without having to mix them super high so the vocals can stick out. And then you add in the center track, which is even lower volume-wise, as you can see here, than the other two. Um, that just really punches up certain frequencies that the sides, which are usually thinner, uh, are lacking. Um, so there you go with that and so that's the basic technique and of course the thin you know I wouldn't want to listen to this by itself necessary it's a little little muddy but uh, it's all about context so there you go with that <clears throat> excuse me uh, you know and and it does work in certain cases because I obviously I have this solo um, for that second verse section because it really was just nice and heavy without ramping up too too much before the chorus that first chorus because it's important to have that first chorus really be nice and big um, in comparison to everything else. Whereas, I, you know, if you did the sides and added the middle, it wouldn't have been as extreme. So that's why I did that, just in case you were curious. And, you know, once again, do do you, um, but keep in mind that there's no set rules, and that's why I did it like this, rather than just having these two go, or, uh, you know, even, um, or even just one side or something like that. Um, so, a uh, quick message about the tones. You need a lot less distortion than you think you need. Um, I used a lot in the middle because it's by itself, but since I'm layering these, I mean, you can hear that, you know, that sounds, it's pretty distorted, but it's not too, you know, it's not overly so. Um, and it'll even get better here because now we're going to get into the EQ. Now it's important. Now I meant, now when we were doing the cleans, I mentioned that, you know, the, the EQ on that is a little different. Um, because 
it doesn't have distortion. And what distortion does is it excites higher frequencies in that when you put a signal of like a guitar through a, a distortion, the lower frequency called the fundamental, which is like the actual note you're thinking of when you're playing it. So like, you know, the low E string, you're playing that E, that's the note you're thinking of. It comes with a lot of baggage in higher frequencies and, and actually a little bit of lower frequencies sometimes too, but that's a different thing. Um, but it, it'll have higher frequencies that ring out because of the way the strings round, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, don't want to get too deep into it, but basically what distortion does is it excites those higher frequencies so you get a lot of more high sounds and it often just sounds a little buzzy if you're not careful what's been what's interesting is a lot of speakers uh have don't project over a certain frequency that's why early modeling or certain mo if you just put a distortion filter on a you know without an amp it sounds really buzzy but a lot of good speakers actually cut off at a certain frequency thusly i'll show you here where I've got a high cut at 6474, um, or rather a low pass, or you can call it a high cut, um, with a decent slope. Slope is basically just how steeply it cuts off. I don't do like the most extreme slope, but just enough so that way you get this sound. Which, once again, sounds thin by itself, um, but we're not really worried about what it sounds like by itself. It's got to fit in context. It's it's all about context. Like it, it may sound like a little thin by itself, and um, and whatnot. But there you go. Um, and that's how EQ works. Now, what you'll notice is I'm able to do this. Uh, uh, one thing I will note is a lot of people use Audacity, and Audacity is a great DAW, digital audio workstation. You can't really do what I'm doing here and just apply EQs. One you know, or any, or any effects to the channel while playing it. One that is, I think, free to use, though, it, you know, it's like basically trial wear, but it's not really too heavy handed about it, is called um, Reaper. Check it out. I mean, I know a few folks who use it. It's fairly inexpensive. I just, I would recommend getting it um, and at least trying it out. And maybe you'll be like, I don't know, but uh, it's worth a go, I think, um, because it, it really does uh, does a lot. So moving on here. Um, so you notice that it's kind of thin, but that's what the thickener's for as well, because what you can do with the middle track is, that sounds disgusting, doesn't it? Well, look at this EQ, like it's raw. And of course we have the middle EQ as talked about before. This is kind of where the vocals sit usually. So you want to like, you know, just, and you know, these are carrying a lot of that mid range anyway that middle sound, um, and they don't have a lot of low end or anything else, so you compensate with this guy. You don't want to give it too much low end, because otherwise it'll eat up the bass, and nobody wants that. Well, I don't want that, because I'm a bass player, but I really feel like bass frequencies, like when you have a bass that's nice and powerful and not being eaten up by the guitars, it really just punches up everything. And of course, there's certain styles that don't you know, recommend that, but for something like this, you definitely want to work with that. So you basically listen to this, and it's like... Okay, so this is good. I mean, it's distorted. It's nice. It works. Um, you know, oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It works, and, you know, you might go later and be like, okay. Uh, it's got some nice chugginess to it, but it's like, man, I, I, I really think the guitars, because, you know, even after you, sometimes even if after you add the bass, which is down here, it's like, yeah, that's nice and punchy, but, like, you could really use some more of that like that, that that certain punch and crunch that you get. Well, that's what the middle one's for, and that's why this EQ looks so wacky, because you give it a lot in the 2 kilohertz range, you give it some more beef in the 100 hertz range, and you just destroy the mids on it, and... And it just punches everything the heck up. And again, you know, it's a little quieter than the rest of them, but, you know. Yeah. 
nice and big. And that's how you get a good big guitar sound uh, just from the EQ. And you can do more layers, absolutely. A lot of metalcore bands that I'm aware of, like Killswitch Engage and a few others, often triple track or quadruple track, excuse me. Or even uh, Linkin Park is a good example because they have decent production. Quadruple tracking is literally just doing two, um, two LRs and having ones all the way over and some like more closer to the middle, usually 75 to 50% in the middle. So like, you know, you'd have two over here and then two over here. You know, it, it's that that's one technique. I'm lazy, um, also minimalist. So I typically go with the three. In fact, it took me a while to move to the three, but I really like the way this sounds um, in most situations. And again, it doesn't always work. You know, I would rather record all three and try it and then be like, mm, you know, it doesn't, isn't, mm, something's missing or something's too much. You know, it depends on the context of what you got going on. The other thing that you can do um, is do reverb. There's two ways you can do it. Um, the preferred way is when you can have buses set up and uh, with reverb for guitars, if, if you're recording them right. And there's, of course, a recording link that I'll have in the thing. But the one one thing you can do is you can have <clears throat> um, reverb going on. Let me see if I can get this. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. So let me make this bigger for you here. Boom. There's the reverb. Um, thank God I was able to do that. So um, what, this looks like a lot. All right. Ignore this and ignore this okay because a lot of reverbs don't necessarily have eq and this is kind of important but what you can do is just you know use a little less reverb but basically you know you don't want too much of the high like again it's this is similar to the eq you've already seen if you do have eq on your reverb just just you know eq at the lows eq at the highs boom you know uh you know even more so tightly than otherwise so there's two ways you can do it. The one way you can do it is using a bus where you just route all these through here. Um, oops. Let me, move this, let me move this over here. So you route all these through uh, all of these through here. Um, so you can see where that goes. So you realize you know, it goes through this one. Um, and you have it so that this is completely. Notice this is. Um, oh, my God. Notice this is dry is negative infinite. That means that there's no dry signal being allowed through the reverb, and it's just the um, the wet signal uh, or or the affected signal. And uh, I have this pre like negative, but that's because um, I made this preset long ago before I started doing this, and it would often have. And this is why I'm bringing this up now. And you can get ambience, and this is actually a preset here. I think it's on there, um, but I kind of messed with it a little bit, but no big deal. Um, this is on kbraudio.com. I think it's still there anyway. Um, but you can have it. So you would put the effect on each one, and you can apply it. And you would use this. And once again, you might even want it a little drier than negative you know, th this here. Maybe a little wetter, depending on how big you know everything is. But uh, typically, you want it not too much reverb, but just enough. And it adds a nice stereo field, and it mixes in everything. Because... Let me show you in context here what it sounds like with reverb and without reverb, and you'll get the idea. And then I'll go real quick over what, um, you know, what 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 the reverb does here. So here's without reverb. Yeah. You see here how much like space is added and how it comes in and it just fills it out even more. Yeah, that's the nice thing about reverb. And as I said, if you you know if you want it to be a little less, just subtract it as needed. But I like you know for this style, obviously I want it a lot, um, a lot more than I would normally necessarily and. Again, you don't have to. Uh, it also depends on what you're doing, um, but there you go. Uh, so, oh, God, I want to select the other one. There we go. Um, so there's that. Um, I'm going to just remove this. Oh, real quick, before I before I finish that out here, um, the ambience 
is this has you know this has the shape and it and everything so you can have the size of the room how much like just pre-delay which is i don't really pay attention to that too much but you know you just have it pretty short um and but what we really want to pay attention to is this has a two second delay time to 2000 milliseconds and it diffuses pretty quickly so basically when you hit hear the sound it has the delay time and then it's basically the shape of how it drops off so that's important to note. So you you know you want something that does that, and you want a fairly big room for this sort of reverb. Again, you can play with this. Like the smaller the room, obviously, the the less big the reverb's gonna sound, and the bigger the room, you know, the 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 more spread out it's gonna sound. And some reverbs are stereo. I would look for a stereo reverb if you're gonna do busing. If you're not gonna do busing, you can find a, uh, a you know a mono reverb. But um, but that's how that goes. And that's that's some just good best practices. Uh, for for mixing rhythm uh, guitars. And reverb is the last step. Get everything sounding really, really good before the you you do the um, before you do that and that way it'll still sound good no matter what. Because again, even without the reverb it still sounds pretty good. I just like the sense of space that you get and uh, oh. so yeah. It just helps things mix in a little bit more. Something happened with that reverb. I think I was messing with it too much, and I need to readjust it. But uh, but yeah, it's normally not even that noticeable. So there you go. Um, I hope you enjoyed this again, and uh, we'll be back with part three, where I'm probably going to go over uh, the drums and like some best practices for drum mixing, which is going to be hairy because I'm probably doing a lot of things wrong with drums, as I'm you know not a drummer or too experienced. But I can show you what I do, and if you're using a sampler, it's probably how it's going to work out for you in this style. So we'll do that next, and then uh, we'll go from there. So y'all have a good day, and I hope you to hear.